Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another of our honors colloquium, Just Good Foods. And um, I'm first told that I need to be the flight attendant and to let you know that there are exits um, to the side of the stage and at the back of the auditorium in case of an emergency. There are unisex bathrooms out in the lobby. Please silence your phones, no photos or camera recordings during the event. And um, tonight we are going to have a land acknowledgement which is gonna be given by Silver Moon LaRose accompanied by Nikos and Ore LaRose. Asquikwasanumis, everyone. Hello to you all. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome you tonight here to the lands of the Narragansett, our community. Uh, this year's Honors Colloquium is focused on creating equitable, sustainable, and resilient food systems. But for whom are we doing all this work? We're doing this for our next generations. This is our inheritance to them, to prosper, to carry on, to increase, we lay the groundwork for the successes that they're gonna to see to fruition. So tonight we will hear about urban farming, community, organization, and family. And I'd like to introduce you to some of my family, my two sons, Nikus and Ore. A little bit smaller. <laughs> Kanupiam, welcome. The lands where you sit tonight are the homelands of my family, my ancestors, and the home of those who will come after me. In this place, we work, we learn, we grow, we share, we feed, and are fed. We remember this place as our Nukas Aki, our Earth Mother, who cares for us and who we care for in return. Tabutni, thank you. Thank you for all you do to create a better world for us to grow up in. Thank you for your focus on sustainability, your dedication to creating equity, and the love you put into the work that you do. Be inspired that the positive actions you are all taking today are appreciated by us children and will continue to be celebrated seven generations from now. Thank you for providing for our future. Katabatamish, everybody. Wuninakan. I'm now going to introduce our speaker for this evening, Denzel Mitchell, um, a Baltimorean now, would you say? Well, a reluctant Baltimorean, um, an urban farmer with rural roots, born and raised in Guthrie, Oklahoma, um, an HBCU graduate from Langston University in Oklahoma. And um, I met him when he was a student in library sciences at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I saw him again when he was a teacher by day in a private school in, in Silver Springs, Maryland, I believe, and a raw food chef by night um, before he took up farming full time. He's a father of four boys and one girl, no small feat in this day and age, and a cap capoeiro master. Can you still spit on your head? Maybe? Maybe? Okay. I remember when I was in D.C. for a year, he introduced me to his capoeira classes, and I lasted about a month. But anyway, that's another story. Please put your hands together for Denzel Mitchell. Wow. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. This is uh, quite the surreal experience to drive all the way up to uh, Rhode Island um, in the middle of the night to uh, give a talk in what seems like the middle of the night. <laughs> um, so I just wanna, I'm, I'm very glad that everybody, everyone is here. Um, this, is, uh, this is very exciting. I haven't done anything like this in uh, quite some time in an academic setting. Probably the last time was in Catherine's class at the University of Oklahoma. Um, so 
I'm, you know, I'm very grateful for this experience. And uh, so I just want to kind of start um, with uh, some thank yous um, and an acknowledgement of, of uh, gratitude and a, a moment of reflection. Um, so I'm particularly thankful uh, for this opportunity, but really for just um, an opportunity to be able to share, uh, be able to teach, um, <clears throat> to be able to cook. You know, I got, got the opportunity to, to work with a very close friend and colleague of mine tonight to, uh, to make a very, very special dinner for folks here. And um, don't get to do that enough. And I had a, had a, had a tremendous time. Um, but I specifically want to uh, be thankful first to Great Spirit, to God, um, for giving life and for providing everything that we need on this planet. Uh, my ancestors, known and unknown, everybody who uh, made sacrifices um, that allowed for me to be here, to be able to do this today. <clears throat> and um, thank you to, to Dr. Catherine John uh, for making the phone call and kind of the push to, uh, to come on up here to uh, Rhode Island. Um, and then the, the uh, staff and all the folks at, here at the University of Rhode Island who, who have made this happen over the last few months and then particularly today, which was a lot. Um, and my friend, homeboy, colleague, colleague uh, coworker, uh, Damian Mosley, who uh, very graciously came up and uh, cooked with me today. And finally, my wife uh, of 25 years and my five children that, uh, um, Catherine mentioned, who um, you know I do this for, because um, they need things. <clears throat> um, so you know we've had a really challenging last couple of years. Um, you know, although we we're not talking about it as much, 2020 for many of us was was incredibly challenging, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know some not not so good memories. Um, but we're here. We're here together. We're here in this moment um, to celebrate and talk and learn and share. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, I have a huge amount of gratitude for the fact that I'm able to be here with you all, but I'm also uh, able to be here with my children and see them to be successful. Um, and they're great kids. <clears throat> and so I just wanna take a moment, you know, to just, for everybody to reflect on what it is that you're thankful for, um, what it is that you have gratitude for um, just just briefly. All right. Um, so I so I want to dig into this, uh, but at first I want to make sure everybody's paying attention and that uh, you all are properly enlivened and, and amused. I'm a huge huge music fan. Anybody who knows me knows I, I love music and listen to music a lot. I am particularly a rap fan. Um, and so, you know, I kind of walk around all day with uh, songs playing in my head, um, but also lines that really speak to, to me, to who I am, and uh, how far I've gotten. Um, and just lines that help to ground me. So I'm going to speak those lines and I want you guys to repeat them. Um, they're very simple, and, uh, and I'll try to remember to bring them back up later on in the talk for you, for you, to, uh, for you to repeat. But the first one is from uh, an artist, a favorite artist of mine from Chicago, Illinois. His name is Mick Jenkins, a uh, young guy. And in 2013, I was introduced to his album, The Waters. And one of the, the refrains in that, in that album was very simple, very simple statement, drink more water. And for me, it is, it is a reminder, obviously, to drink more water. Um, but then also, again, that to just be thankful for what the earth is able to produce, what the waterways produce, and how uh, that relationship with what the earth produces is so near and dear to us. So on the count of three, I want you guys to repeat, drink more water. One, two, three. I love it. Beautiful. All right. Number two. Um, is from a, a very recent favorite artist of mine, a young man named Elucid, one half of group Arm & Hammer, um, quite underground, not well known, 
Uh, I was kind of hoping that one of these young people would be like, oh, I know Armin Hammer, but nobody did, so that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but in, he, uh, in his most recent release from this year, uh, an album called I Told Bessie, uh, which is a tribute to his grandmother, which is also, again, is something that speaks very near and dear to me. Uh, on a song called Betamax, he has a line that says, free the land, I am a farmer in a skyscraper. And if that line isn't more true for me, I don't know what it is. I mean, I've had now the span of 30 years of working in the food system, and here now in 2022, um, I get to farm with my feet under a desk. Um, not on a tractor anymore, or not, I don't get to dig around in the dirt like I really uh, like to, um, you know, but I had to kind of take the responsibility of teaching others. So, but at the same time, it's a very powerful political statement about freeing the land um, and acknowledgement as, as we just had that the land does not belong to us. Um, and that in many cases, the land has been taken, has been stolen, um, and it's been misused. <clears throat> so on the count of three, I would like for you all to repeat that. Um, one, two, three. I'm a farmer in a skyscraper. There we go. All right. And then the last one is from a, a classic, classic album, classic group, A Tribe Called Quest. I'm sure you've heard of them before. They're one of their... Uh, their late releases before the uh, uh, 2020 uh, was the love movement and they had a refrain in that album that said we do it for the love we do it for the love y'all and you know that has been something that I've carried with me through my entire career you know at the end of the day I do this for the love and we'll circle back to that but on the count of three I would like for you all to say we do it for the love y'all one two three Beautiful. Great. All right. So um, as Catherine said, my name is uh, Denzel Mitchell Jr. Um, I am not named after Denzel Washington. Um, I'm named after my father, who uh, was named after a man that my grandfather worked with. Um, and I do food. Um, I've been doing food now for uh, quite some time. I'm probably close to 30 years. Um, my career has meandered quite a bit. It looks very much like that, uh, that graphic of what success looks like, where it's just kind of this, this uh, ball of string, and eventually you kind of make it out, and uh, here I am today. <clears throat> um, but I do food from the rooter to the tutor, uh, as the old folks used to say, or at least my old folks used to say. Anybody familiar with that term, know what that means? My man. All right. So for those of you who are not, if you look at a, a pig, I'm <clears throat> sorry, Catherine, to make a pig reference again, but if you look at a pig, the pig has two ends, the rooter and the tutor. <clears throat> and those of us who believe in using the whole animal, those of us who believe in sustainability, those of us who believe in not wasting, recognize that the rooter is just as important as the tutor <clears throat> to the pig, but then also to the consumer. And so I've been involved in food um, through all aspects of the food system. Production, preservation, plating, and I do a little bit of eating as well. Um, but my entire career has been wrapped up in the food system. And so even when I was a classroom teacher, um, teaching high school students, uh, the relationship to food is a very, very important one. It was one I often spent time teaching to whether it was through music, whether it was through his history, whether it was through sociology, whether it was through literature. And these kind of references are everywhere. The reason why is because food is important to us. We got to eat every single day. You know, we, can, we make choices sometimes not to eat, but we eat every single day. <clears throat> and it is incredibly important that we are cognizant and remember that the complicated systems that are involved with bringing food to you. <clears throat> but then also, if you didn't cook it, somebody else did, and that required some skill. And so every single day when I sit down to a meal, <clears throat> I'm thanking God, I'm thanking my ancestors, I'm thanking my family, but I'm also thanking whatever farmer, known or unknown, that brought the food to the table. I'm also thanking the cook, 
that prepared the food and put it in front of me, and specifically, or especially thanking them if the food tastes good. Um, I'm a descendant of enslaved Africans. Um, and one of the things that we're now relearning to do in this country is to recognize those contributions those folks made um, many, in many, many cases involuntarily, but in some cases willingly. Um, and those contributions have made our society, as we experience it now, better. Um, and so, you know, as we understand our relationship with history, um, the, the beauty and the joy and the tri triumph that a lot of us are experiencing now came on the backs of, of, of pain and suffering, but also resilience and grit. You know, you just gotta make it through. I also need to acknowledge that I'm a descendant of indigenous folks who were forcibly migrated from the American Deep South along the Trail of Tears uh, as a result of the Indian Removal Act. Um, and my ancestors were Creek freedmen. Uh, these were black folks, um, enslaved Africans that traveled along to Oklahoma, which at the time was considered no man's land or unclaimed territory before, this, before Oklahoma became a state. And they created an, a home, created a new home for themselves. So uh, combining those two, I'm a descendant of Creek Freedmen. Those Africans have found community um, amongst the indigenous people in the quote unquote Indian territories after decades of double subjugation under the tyranny of white supremacy, but also under the peculiar institution of enslavement. <clears throat> so that is something that I center, and it's, I think it's super important that you know who your people are and what your people experienced, what they went through for you to be where you are. Um, <clears throat> so I was raised by cooks, cowboys, and country people. Um, so I, you know, I probably can't consider myself a country boy anymore, uh, living in Baltimore um, since 2006. But I know my way around the country still, maybe, kind of. Um, I, I was raised by folks that farmed, that fished, that foraged, that hunted, um, that homesteaded. Um, these folks loved hard, they worked hard, uh, and they probably drank a little too much. Um, so, you know, we are dealing with all of that. We are, we are pushing through those experiences. And finally, I am a product of hip-hop culture. I am a fan of rap music, and it is much of what informs my worldview. Um, you know, I had the, the great fortune to be well-educated um, by my parents, my mother, my grandparents, um, and also um, widened my lens by listening to rap music and getting a different perspective on the world. And I'm not gonna say that rap music raised me, but it was a huge influence on the person that I am today. Hence the references I gave you all to start us out. Um, my worldview, life, and work has been heavily shaped by the art, music, and culture happenings of the 80s and 90s. Um, and to make a reference to Bukhari Kitwana, I am a member of the hip hop generation. <clears throat> so my greatest influences uh, are my two grandmothers. Um, Will DeLee Farley, my mother's mother, and Hazel Mitchell, my father's mother. They taught me the value of food from a very, very young age. Um, waste nothing, take your time in the kitchen, clean up behind yourself, and season your food, baby. <clears throat> uh, the most important seasoning being love. If you don't love what you're doing, it's probably not gonna come out correctly. Um, and so that's something that I, those lessons are, are lessons that I carry with me um, in my work. Um, the other two women that I need to mention are my two great aunts, my maternal grandmother's aunts, uh, Alma and Luetha Gresham. Um, these are the kind of folks who seem like they were old my entire life. Anybody relate? Um, so these two aunties, they lived on a 160-acre 
homestead right outside of Henrietta, Oklahoma, not too far from Tulsa. This land was deeded to my family, to my ancestral family, as a result of the Dawes Act of 1887. Everybody familiar with that? We're on a college campus, y'all should know. My man, okay, all right. So this was land that was given by the United States government in an attempt to expand the territory of the United States, right? Further taking land from our indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, in an attempt to, uh, to assimilate um, Native Americans and force them to kind of change their traditional way of living and accept this notion of American imperialism. So we're gonna give you 160 acres if you wanna farm. We're gonna give you 320 acres if you wanna graze. And so as my people were Creek Freedmen, they had a number on the Dawes roll, and so they were given this 160 acres. And so my mother, my mother's sister, my grandmother, her siblings, and her mother and their siblings all grew up on this land. So they called it, they called it home. Um, and so because they called it home, we spent a lot of time traveling there as children. Um, so I like to say that I grew up farm adjacent. So, you know, the town I grew up in was probably about two hours away, but we spent a lot of time in the country. A lot of times they would, school would finish in June, they'd drop us off the second week of June and not come back until August. Um, so that's where I grew up. That's where I, I forged my relationship with the land. It's where I learned how to forage. <clears throat> Just like they learned how to forage by their elders and ancestors before them and them before them. Where we would just go out into the woods and they, and they taught us what you could eat. Now, obviously, I couldn't do that when I went to Maryland because, you know, the uh, wild vegetation is different. But it is something that I learned. It's something that they incorporated. They would... They would harvest sand plums and make sand plum jelly. They'd harvest poke salad, which as a farmer, if there's any farmers in the room, we all know that we consider poke salad to be a weed. But poke salad was something that sustained us as African people. Um, and and my, my ancestors, my elders, continued that practice throughout, well, well into my adulthood. And I'm grateful for that. Um, so I spent many days on that farm, and those memories bring much joy, <clears throat> very little hurt, um, and it was easily the richest part of my childhood. So these two women, um, one was mean and couldn't hear good, so you had to talk loud to talk to her, and it's probably the reason why I talk loud now. Uh, the other one was completely blind and had been blind since she was uh, nine years old. And they lived here on this 160-acre homestead, and they cared for the land. And they lived completely independent. Um, they, they had decided to stay there. Their siblings didn't want to stay on their farm. <clears throat> their elders did not want to stay on the farm. The, those two decided to stay. And so Alma and Luetha decided to stay on the land, <clears throat> and I'm grateful for that. Because, because they stayed, I was able to have that experience and, and be the person that I am today. Um, they, so they ran the farm for many, many years. They raised pigs, cattle, chicken, vegetables, fruit trees, nut trees. Very, very enriching experience. And now in hindsight, um, I realized why we were traveling there so much. It was because they were using us as labor. Um, so, you know, as I started to understand the seasons, I was like, oh, we are going when the chicks are getting put out. Oh, we're going when it's time to harvest peaches. Oh, we're going when it's time to harvest pecans. Got it. Understood. Um, but I learned a lot. Uh, I learned the value of hard work. Um, they, they grew killed or caught everything that they ate. They foraged, they preserved, they canned. They were practicing food sovereignty and sustainability before it was a thing. Really interesting thing about the 
farm about the house is that they had no indoor plumbing or running water. So I had the experience of using an outhouse and a chamber pot. Anybody use outhouse before? It's quite a humbling experience. Um, chamber pot, not fun. The reason why is because the local oil company, actually one of the first companies to discover oil in Oklahoma, uh, was Coke Oil and Gas, now known as Coke Industries. So it is now the second largest privately held company in the United States. They had swindled my ancestors out of mineral rights on the land. You can keep the land, y'all can stay here, it's fine. Just, just sign um, this uh, document that you can't read and we'll pump oil from the land. So as a result, they pierced the aquifer. And so the water table was polluted. And so when we went to the farm, there was no water. So my great aunt, she had a pickup truck with two 50-gallon drums that she would drive into town to the, to the park to fill up with water so that they would have water to use for washing, bathing, drinking, watering the animals, cleaning, cooking. Resilience. The Gresham Homestead didn't get indoor plumbing and a legit bathroom until 1992. Shout out to Coke Oil and Gas. They taught me about work ethic and being consistent, waking up early, doing chores before dark. dark. Oftentimes for us kids, it was milking the cows <clears throat> and then coming in and eating a huge breakfast, which I absolutely hated because the milk that I was getting from the cow then ended up on my cornflakes with a very tiny amount of sugar and oftentimes the milk was still warm. Um, so I hated it, but now I appreciate, I appreciate that experience. Um, and so from them I learned the importance of a purpose-filled day. <clears throat> when I get up in the morning, what am I planning to do today? What is, what is it that I want to accomplish? Why is this day important? Because tomorrow is not. Um, so these are the lessons I carried around with me as I kind of embarked on my professional journey. <clears throat> um, I learned to cook at the feet of my grandmother and my grandfathers. As I mentioned, both of my parents' mothers were excellent and private, prideful cooks. My mom actually hated cooking. She cooked because she loved us. She didn't cook because she, she didn't cook because she loved cooking. She cooked because she loved us. Um, but I learned the practice of cooking from, from those two women, from my grandma Fish, my grandma Wilda, Wilda Lee, and grandma Hazel. My mother's mother was a professional cook. She was a maid in the homes of white folks in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, my mother's, my father's mother, uh, would feed anybody that came to the door. And she took a massive amount of pride in the food that she, she put out. My grandma Hazel loved to bake. Uh, her specialty were desserts, pound cakes, and pies. And so as a result, only like two types of pie, hot and cold. Uh, I started to study the practice of cooking food um, about the same time as my youngest child uh, at the age of 12. Um, obviously before the days of internet, um, but I used to watch PBS, and I remember watching chefs from around the world, appreciated some old folks with a nod that they remember that show, um, where you get to watch just the hands of a chef prepare this incredibly interesting meal on public TV. So I was enthralled. So a lot of times I would watch that show and then go back and talk to my grandmother about these practices, which she was very, very, very much aware of. She didn't cook that way, but she was aware of it because she had access to all these cookbooks and the expectations in working inside these folks' homes. So I learned about the professionalism of cooking, that cooking is, in fact, a skilled profession that you have to study. Um, so, while everybody else was outside uh, playing basketball, 
hide and go get it, uh, whatever else. I was inside reading cookbooks and uh, being very nerdy. Um, but by the time I was 16, I wanted to be a chef. Um, cooking is a passion of mine because it creates happiness. Um, it is one of the common things that I've chosen to learn how to do uncommonly well. As George Washington Carver said, uh, we often take for granted the skill involved with bringing a delicious plate of food to the table and really only acknowledge it when we pay these exorbitant amounts of money for food. But every single day, whether it's yourself, your partner, your parents, your family, your roommate, somebody spent and took the time to nourish you. And that is not a light feat. Um, I am not formally trained. I just spent a bunch of time in kitchens, and I really took this task seriously and wanted to, 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 be, to be good at it, and I hope, hope I am. So I kind of learned on the job. Um, when I graduated from high school, I took a, took a job as a line cook and uh, um, uh, a hospital cook in, in a hospital, which was not a good job for a 19-year-old that just got, out of, just got out of high school because I had to be at work at 3 a.m. Didn't keep that job very long. So from there, I learned how to cook barbecue um, and, and, again, learned how to make plates. Um, but I fell in love with food service. Um, I really enjoyed the dining experience and spent a lot of time working in many, many restaurants around town in a very, very small town. So I pretty much worked almost every location in Guthrie before, before I moved away. To, uh, to Baltimore. And over the last 30 years, I've cooked everything from barbecue to, as uh, Catherine said, raw vegan cuisine for people. Um, thankfully, I've been able to continue to pursue that passion uh, and cook at one of the greatest eateries in Baltimore City, Black Sauce Kitchen, since 2013. And my goal here is not to be some James Beard Award um, to be acknowledged, <clears throat> my goal is just to make good food, um, to make in intentional food that quietly reveals who I am, food that is remembered. <clears throat> and so I hope, you know, I was able to do that today with the meal that really spoke to my, my upbringing and my family. <clears throat> so... I'm going to, as I'm talking, just recognize that this is kind of a science fiction story in that I'm going to be giving you three timelines, right, because I've had six, six careers now at this, at this uh, point in my life. Um, and so as I was cooking, I also was playing with the idea of being a farmer and what that, what that means and dedicated some time to that. Um, gardening is a powerful practice in sustainability, and it was how I was raised. Every single home that I went to as a child and as an adolescent had a garden. My moms, my grandparents, my aunties, my uncles. I have a distinct memory of my grandfather, my mother's mother, my mother's father, coming to our home every year in the wee hours of the spring, Bef oftentimes before dark, no, no announcement, no fanfare. He would just show up, go to the carport, pull the tools out, and start to turn over my mother's garden for the year, every year, until he couldn't. And I just recognize now how powerful of a gesture of love that that was. <clears throat> so it was something I held for a long time. So... Kind of fast forward, so having this experience of growing food, having this experience of spending a lot of time on the farm, I kind of circled back to that and decided that I wanted to start my own farming journey in 2007. It was really for my children. Um, as I was explaining to the students today, I wanted my kids to 
have a very similar experience to what I had growing up. So I didn't live in Oklahoma anymore. I now lived in Baltimore. So I, to reference Booker T. Washington, cast my bucket where I was. Set roots here and decided to do it where I was, in Baltimore. So we were living in the city. I had four very, very young kids. And I just started to grow food. And quickly found, and as many of you probably can relate to, that that knowledge that I didn't know that I had welled up. And that I, in fact, do know how to grow. That I had been taught how to grow, and how to sustain, how to preserve. <clears throat> that this was knowledge that was just kind of innate in me because it was how I was raised. <clears throat> Again, grateful. So we started growing uh, in a little shaded garden plot in our backyard. Um, that expanded to assorted pots and planters and things in the driveway, much to my wife's chagrin because she did not marry a, a farmer. Um, that expanded to growing in other people's backyards. That then expanded to adopting nine vacant lots in the middle of Baltimore City across the street from our house and turning that into a space for growing and producing food. Started producing food just for ourselves and my family, um, then our friends, then our neighbors, then our community. <clears throat> then I realized that like, oh, this can become an enterprise. I can start to, I could sell some of this stuff, which we started to do. So that site became known as Five Seeds Farm and was one of the first urban farms in Baltimore City. So from 2008 to 2016, I was a farmer, owner and operator um, of this farm named after my five babies. Um, during that time, I grew vegetables in my yard, other people's yard around the city, and then eventually scaled up to a seven acre plot in, outside of the city in Baltimore County. And we sold vegetables to restaurants at the farmer's market. We operated a 50 person CSA learn how to keep bees, manage fruit trees, keep chickens, uh, raise laying hens, raise broilers, turkeys, have a scar from a turkey still today, because um, they don't like being killed, as most things don't. Um, and I learned how to cook vegetables and, learn, and realized that learning how to cook makes you a better vegetable salesman. So I spent time studying the craft and practice of farming and food production and food preservation. And again, sustainability, but you know, we didn't call it sustainability, we just called it putting some jars up, putting some, putting some cans up, filling the freezer, having food that we produced, that we grew to eat in the winter when there was nothing to produce. There was no way to produce anything. Spent a lot of that time visiting as many farms as I could and making friends and creating a network um, and learning from people that were doing, that had been doing what I, what I was wanting to do for many, many years and learning and receiving from them and, and creating some social fabric that I could then lean on as a farmer. And I still maintain many of those relationships today. Um, and I built social capital that would continue to serve me throughout my meandering career. So now as a cook, you know, I can call a farmer when I'm in search of some greens. As a cook, if I need some honey, I can call a beekeeper. As a cook, I can call somebody who raises chickens for eggs and get eggs. And that's important. Um, those kind of cyclical relationships are important. It was during this, area, this era that I was introduced to the Baltimore fish pepper, which, which created a shift in how I approached my work and my career. Um, the Baltimore fish pepper has an incredibly interesting story in the history of Maryland cuisine. So the pepper itself was supposedly, as legend would have it, introduced to the enslaved Africans in the Chesapeake region, in Maryland by the indigenous. Those same 
enslaved folks went into the, their homes and the homes of uh, the folks that owned them and cooked and used this pepper as seasoning. So much so that it, and it paired so well with the food that Maryland is known for, crabs, shrimp, oysters, that it, was, it became known as the fish pepper. So as I, so, and <clears throat> so, so very, very, very important part of the cuisine. This pepper was the, probably the most important uh, pepper from the Philadelphia to DC corridor. Many of the crab houses and restaurants that folks were working in, they had their own fish pepper sauce recipe. One of the things that's really interesting about the pepper is that it has this trait of albinism. And so out of so many plants, one plant will have no pigment, including the fruit that it produces. It will ripen completely to white. And so what our ancestors discovered is that you could dry this pepper, grind it, and turn it into a white pepper, which then they could use to season what at the time was Baltimore's most famous dish, oyster stew, which is a cream base, which is, which is a cream based stew. And so now you've got a white pepper to season a cream based cream base stew. So it kind of solidified its, uh, um, its space in Chesapeake Bay cuisine. Um, then as a, as a result of negligence and, pop, and pollution, um, people in the Maryland region stopped eating so much seafood. They couldn't eat as much seafood. Uh, the, uh, the bay had been overfished, had been over, um, over oystered. And so as a result, the fish pepper uh, fell in decline and was forgotten. So this is where I come in. So around 2009, as I was learning the practice of farming and <clears throat> trying to figure out what to sell and who I want to sell to, a very dear farmer mentor of mine said, you should grow fish peppers. Grow fish peppers and I'll, and I'll introduce you to somebody. So I did some research and learned that it, it was, in fact, the most popular pepper in the Chesapeake region from the 1850s to 19, 1950s, that it had this, this uh, very, very close connection to African-American heritage in the Chesapeake Bay, um, and that very, very, very few farmers were still growing it. Um, so I decided to start growing it. And as a result, the, a very close chef friend of mine uh, started to make his own hot sauce. He, his restaurant, in his restaurant, he wanted to have a uh, hot sauce that, was, that spoke directly to Maryland cuisine and Maryland history. Um, and he wanted to be able to serve oysters. They, they served a, a, a plethora of oysters at the restaurant. He wanted hot sauce that came directly from Maryland. So I started to grow the, the uh, peppers. He created the hot sauce, match made in heaven. Um, the, the, pepper story, the pepper story really touched me as another reminder of black folks' contribution to American cuisine, <clears throat> culture, and, it's, and it was a beautiful pepper. So he started to buy the peppers from me, and snake oil was born. So then subsequently, many, many more farmers in the region started growing fish peppers as well. And ultimately, the restaurant was able to make more hot sauce, and now the fish pepper has come back into the collective palate. So, you know, that is one of the legacies that I'd like to point to. One of the students today asked me, is there any one particular thing that I'm particularly proud of? Um, and I had never really thought about it before 
um, I kind of paused at the, the notion of the, of the question, um, you know, but that was, that's one thing. Um, you know, I met a couple of people who introduced me to this, uh, to this pepper, and I was able to grow it and um, support a, another local business to then produce, uh, to produce this hot sauce. Um, so, uh, we ran Five Seeds Farm until uh, 2016. Uh, we ran a 50 share CSA, sold to several restaurants, and sold it at uh, several farmers market in the uh, Baltimore, DC region. Um, at, in, during, at, uh, in 2016, uh, realized that farming uh, wasn't necessarily the financial path or financially viable for for my family, so we had to close the farm. Um, in 2017, I took over as the farm manager in a farm in Baltimore City uh, called Strength to Love, where we uh, trained and worked with folks that had previously been incarcerated to produce vegetables um, for neighborhoods in West, West Baltimore. Um, so I worked at Strength to Love from 2017 until 2020. Then in 2020, um, I was asked to, to uh, serve with the Farm Alliance of Baltimore. <clears throat> so the Farm Alliance of Baltimore is a nonprofit organization uh, that was founded 10 years ago. Um, it was an organization that I was a founding member of, uh, and it was just a group of us farmers kind of coming together, um, wanting to share resources, wanting to share marketing space, wanting to share knowledge, equipment, um, and learning as we learn the craft of farming. In Baltimore City, there's two major farmers markets. And many of us understood that as urban farmers, we couldn't on a quarter acre, eighth of an acre, half, an, half of an acre, we couldn't quite produce enough food to, to be able to, to stock a viable stand at the farmer's market. So we came together to share resources, to share, to share space, bring all of our produce together, and sell, sell together. That relationship, that community, morphed into a nonprofit organization that now serves 19 farms in Baltimore City and about 110 people in Baltimore City who work on farms, are farmers, um, or as we like to say, are farm adjacent. Um, so the, I, I served as the deputy director for the Farm Alliance uh, for two years, and then in January of this year, I was promoted to the co-executive co director of the Farm Alliance um, and had the fantastic opportunity to launch the Black Butterfly Urban Farm Academy, which gave me an opportunity to be able to share the knowledge and experience that I've gained over the last 15 years and teach other people how to farm. Um, our, our most recent accomplishment this year was to secure 15 acre lease on seven acres in South Baltimore in the Curtis Bay neighborhood in Faring Baybrook Park to build and design the Black Butterfly Farm, which will serve as a teaching and demonstration site in Baltimore City. <clears throat> so, um, The, the work that I do is based on values. Um, education, sustainable agriculture, solidarity, collective power, and equity. <clears throat> as I have been trained, as I've been taught that my education means very little if I'm not sharing it with other people. 
And so as I've had this opportunity to work with so many amazing people, so many academics and scholars, chefs, farmers, it was very, very important to me to be able to share that information with other folks and inspire them in the way that I was inspired to do this work. Sustainable agriculture, uh, because we know that the system as it operates now is destroying the earth. And unfortunately, we are going to leave our children and young people the planet in a state that is much worse than how we inherited it. And so my work, and the, one of the things that I want to do is to change that, change the practice so that the young people that do inherit, my children, my children's friends, the students and the folks' lives that I've touched, have access to better opportunities and that they use practices that enhance and improve the earth, the environment, and the workplace, and that there's this synergistic and symbiotic relationship with the earth, that we recognize that the earth gives us everything that we need um, if we don't take too much, and that there's a lot that we owe and we can give back to the earth. Believe in working in community, not working in silos, um, and that there's a lot for us to share and learn amongst each other, and so any time that I can work with, work in collaboration with somebody, I want to do that as well. And that, you know, there's strength in numbers. Um, and that, I'm sh that we are sharing values, concerns, power, and resources to make uh, this world a better place. So as I was saying, this work is a constant expression of love. Love for myself and grateful for the work that I'm able to do, the work that I enjoy. Love for my family, even folks that I consider my family. Um, even when the days are long and difficult, I am reminded that I work for the people that I asked to be with, that I asked to be here, that I asked to enjoy life with me. <clears throat> and love for my community um, and living an exemplary life living a life that other people might, may want to model, um, and in love for the planet and the place that we call home, um, making, it a diligent, making a diligent effort to leave it in a much better space, state, than how I inherited it. So this is kind of the lens that I work through. Um, I love to cook, love to grow, and I love to eat. And again, I'm grateful that my career and my profession has given me a pathway to be able to do all those things all the time, even though most of the time I'm pretty exhausted. Um, so I'm going to end with the words of George Washington Carver. This is one of my favorite quotes. He said, to learn to do common things uncommonly well we must always keep in mind that anything that helps to fill the dinner pail is valuable. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Uh, well, first, I wanted to uh, thank you, brother, for this presentation, for um, bringing this information and your background um, uh, to the forefront here for us. Um, and also, I think that uh, if someone has asked you, I don't know. Hello? Hello? Okay. So I wanted to thank you for bringing this presentation um, and your background to the forefront. And, um, you know, uh, you said that a student asked you what you were proud of and you weren't sure, just someone in this audience someone who's been in spaces like these for about 13 years or so, uh, your history, the black and indigenous background that you have in that family and ancestral history, this is the first I'm hearing about someone who shares that experience and then using that experience and that history to talk about food justice um, is something that I'm just grateful to have gotten today and just something that I think
your ancestors, af absolutely, we'd be proud of you for ensuring that you're putting that to the forefront and making that the focus of your life's work. So just want to commend you on that um, and um, also ask, so my family has a West African food restaurant in downtown Providence. Um, uh, Bintimani, uh, shout out to folks who might heard of it or know of it. Um, we're uh, look to our Instagram. We'll be opening up uh, sometime next week. Um, but so much of what I think about and our family tries to think about um, is how we participate in this community, how we uplift um, this ecosystem, and and just kind of engage and support Rhode Island and Providence with with doing that. So I guess just my uh, question is to the stakeholders that might be here, whether they're students or the institution. What are some ways that Providence and Rhode Island can start building, particularly a BIPOC and black and brown centered um, food ecosystem around those who cultivate? What are some of those first steps maybe that you've observed or experienced in your work? Wow. Uh, yeah, I don't know too much about Providence, so somebody else has to speak on that. But I can kind of talk about what, um, what, what we've done. Um, <clears throat> you know, we. We just, we build community, man. Um, find people who want to do the same things that you, that you want to do. Find people who want to create community around the work that you're doing. Um, and just start, start the work. Um, you know, I met uh, Damien uh, uh, at Black Sauce Kitchen because I was absolutely flabbergasted. There was two very large black men selling biscuits. So I went up and started talking to them. Um, so there's people, I'm sure, in Providence that you find equally interesting. Um, and y'all can find some, you can find some synergy, you can find some connection. Um, I'm sure there's got to be at least one black farmer in Rhode Island. It's a very densely populated state got to be at least one, um, and support them, support their family, learn what they do, um, and find other people that are equally inspired and want to do that kind of work. Um, teach the babies, man. Um, anytime you get an opportunity to spend time with children, you know, I like to spend time with kids in the kitchen and, or outside in the garden, and helping them to develop a relationship with food and developing a relationship with uh, the food web and not be afraid of bees and know the difference between a bee and a wasp. Um, <clears throat> understand like where the uh, eggs come from, um, how carrots are grown, why we shouldn't be eating watermelon in December. Um, you know, children are incredibly resilient, they're smart, and it makes a lot of sense. It's like if we want to change how we interact with our food system, we want to change how we interact with our diet, we got to do that by example. Um, so those are my, that's what I did. Um, you know, so I think you could probably do it here. More questions? Hello? Ah, so I have two questions. One, how do you feel land sovereignty plays into your work, into your life? And also, thinking the aspect of doing community work and having to navigate systems of capitalism, uh, how do you feel like that balance between feeding your community and making sure you're still able to put food on the table, like how do you navigate that space? Great question. What was the first question? Uh, how do slash do you feel uh, land sovereignty placed into the work you do. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. So as I said, free the land. I'm a farmer in a skyscraper. You know, we understand, that, you know, this is, you know, this is a very political statement, but we understand that when we buy a piece of land, we're really just buying a piece of paper, right? Um, that this country, this economic system has uh, created a system in which land can be bought and sold, but we know that land can't really be bought and sold, right? The land that we all know and stand on has been the same land that was here 
6,000 years ago. So it's just kind of a concept that we have to, uh, that we have to adhere to. Um, you, know, you know, land sovereignty means a lot of things uh, to me, but if, you know, one of the, it means two very important things. One, um, I believe in reparations, and I firmly believe in the notion that the land that was stolen from the folks that were here before the United States was what it was, they should be compensated. <clears throat> I also firmly believe that my ancestors that were brought here um, and their labor was exploited should also be comp compensated. Um, and that the, much of the land that we learned to work um, and that we, we propped up the society with should be, should be given to us. Um, in the city, though, I, I also feel that like if a farm, if a farmer is using land that has been vacant and they're producing food for their community, they are transacting business, they should be allowed to keep that land. If they're managing it well, they're stewarding it well, they should be, they should be allowed to keep that land. And so that is part of what we advocate and, and, and push for. Um, in terms of capitalism, again, this is, is where we live. This is the system that we, that we operate on, that there's, current, there's some currency exchange for goods and service. Um, and I've operated a business, and I recognize the value of that. And so I don't think that capitalism is inherently a bad thing. I do think that predatory capitalism and capitalism that in which you know the relationship is not one of equity, it is not one of justice, it is not one of transparency, you know, we all know that that's wrong. Um, you know, and that's, that is, that is, you know, that is a very human understanding of our transactions. All of us want to be able to transact in whatever way with anybody, with honesty, transparency, truthfulness, whether money is involved or not. Um, so, you know, we fight against uh, the practice of trying to take something from somebody or undervaluing, devaluing um, what it is this person needs uh, from you or overcharging them for something that they want. And, you know, we know that that's part of the problem with the food system is that our food has been purposefully devalued. So we now get into a quandary when a farmer wants to sell or needs to sell a dozen of eggs for $6 because we've been kind of fooled into thinking that it only costs $2 to produce a dozen eggs. <clears throat> but there's a huge difference between that $2 dozen of eggs and that $6 dozen of eggs. And one of the massive things is that you are supporting a family. You are supporting folks that you can probably look at, they've probably got children, um, and they, they're humans as opposed to some unknown Non or unknown conglomerate corporation that doesn't have a face, but by law is considered an entity or a person. Um, so, you know, that's part of why we do, why I do what, what, we, what I do, or why we do what we do is, is because we want to interact with humans, and we want to interact with humans that are interacting mindfully with the earth. So we have time for one question. This one. Sorry. <clears throat> Somebody got it in the back. So can you uh, can you hear me? So uh, y you know your story is incredibly inspiring, and uh, you know, and you're very passionate as well, but. Uh, I, I, you know, I know you, and I know Baltimore, and Baltimore is a devastating place. So, you, you know, you've painted this really gorgeous picture of your relationship with the city and with food, but 
I've been there. Like, I've been there with you when people break into your farm or your walk-in, pillage, um, throw trash. And my question is, how do you, how have you managed to bring uh, the knowledge that you grew up with and the spirit that you grew up with, how have you managed to allow that to continue to thrive in a place that doesn't always welcome that? And part of the reason I ask it is because I feel like if we're gonna fight, uh, we're gonna, if, if we're gonna go head on into this battle of uh, trying to improve our planet and trying to make things more sustainable, um, we need hope, we need ways to, to hold on to that hope. And then also I think as you're speaking to this room full of, of young people who have all sorts of ambition and drive, they're gonna run into obstacles. Um, how have you surmounted those obstacles and how have you, you know, how have you continued to, to drive forward and be at peace and be grateful? Like to give thanks that many times in a talk that's more times than I give thanks, usually in a calendar year. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I didn't hear most of your question, but I know what you said because I know you. Um, how? Um, I would say the first thing is the babies. Uh, those of you who know me and who heard uh, Dr. John, I have a lot of children. <clears throat> um, not a lot, like 1940s a lot, but, you know, for 2022, I got a lot. I got five kids. Um, my wife wanted eight. Hi, Tiambe. I'm sure she's watching. Um, and for some crazy reason, I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. <clears throat> um... I don't regret it, um, but it's, it's been a challenge. But at the end of the day, the, one of the, the most joyful <clears throat> experiences that I can remember and uh, relay and that continue to motivate me year after year after year is the experience that I child has of learning something that they previously thought that they understood. Um, that that curiosity, that inquisitiveness, that that is something that I can continue to feed. Um, you know, that's, that's why I do it. I mean, I started as a teacher and really just wanted to inspire young people with like slick historic references and, you know, obscure musical references and then try to feed, put in a little information that they would use and kind of be this cool teacher. Um, but as I kind of started this work, I thought about the fact that the reason why I'm doing this is because I was inspired and that I was taught <clears throat> by example. And this kind of work, we don't appreciate in the same way anymore. We don't appreciate it the way we appreciated it 50 years ago. Um, and, you know, and so it, because we don't appreciate it as something that's outside, outside of the norm, um, which is the reason why I do it and the reason why I keep pushing through. And yes, Baltimore, as many of our major American highly populated cities are absolutely devastated and depressed and having some, and having some, some, some hardships, some unspeakable hardships. Um, you know, but what I want to do and what I feel like we do is stand as a beacon of hope and um, a, a example of professionalism and just taking <clears throat> what you do seriously, so seriously that you can now teach it to somebody else and set a standard for them, and they can go and do it outside of you. I mean, 
Also, some of the greatest experiences are the kids that I taught at Baltimore Montessori Public Charter School. I taught them how to cook. I taught many of them how to garden, who come back to me now as college students, as many of you all are today, and say, Mr. Denzel, you taught me how to make pie crust that my grandmother taught me how to make. Mr. Denzel, you taught me how to use a knife. Um, or somebody's parent who was like, I was terrified to give my nine-year-old this eight-inch chef knife. But I was like, that's the only way that they're going to learn, is by doing. And yes, you're going to cut yourself. That's what a knife is supposed to do. I got tons of cuts. You're not going to die. And at some point, you got to learn how to use a knife. Um, so, you know, I don't know, man. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with... Uh, just resilience and knowing that I owe the people that came before me <clears throat> that the reason why I'm here is because they just kept doing what they were doing. And it wasn't, they weren't doing it for accolades, they weren't doing it for praise. Uh, they were doing it because they felt like it was something that they had to do. So, you know, that's what it is. I just do, I do it because I feel like I have to do it, and I'm very, very lucky. I won't say I'm grateful, even though I am. But I'm very lucky to be able to do something that I enjoy and do it with people that I, that I, that I enjoy being with. And, you know, I, I don't think you can ask for a better professional experience. Can, she had a question. Can she ask? I think, do you want to eat today? I do, I do, but just one question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, damn. What That's... amazing meal. <laughs> uh, so, so, okay, so what did we make? Real, okay, real quick. Um, because I'm getting fed, which is super dope. Um, we made uh, fried fish and hush puppies. We fried cod. Um, that came from you guys, so it came from this region. Um, hush puppies, smoked, smoked cheddar hush puppies, and we dressed it with a uh, nectarine chow chow, uh, which is a traditional relish that I grew up, grew up having quite often, which was kind of whatever was left at the end of the season, you make a relish, pickle it, and it's something that they kept in the, in the cabinets. Um, that was my grandmother's favorite dish. Grandma Fish, called her Grandma Fish because she liked to fish and she liked to eat fish. So that was her dish, fish and hush puppies. Um, we did brown beans and cornbread. Um, very, very simple. Uh, an homage to my grandfather, who that was his favorite dish. My father's father, that was his favorite food, was brown beans and cornbread with lots of ketchup. No ketchup. Um, I'm thankful to John and the farm team for growing Jacob's cattle beans for us and having those for us today for, for the mill. Uh, our third course was grits, greens, and grilled pork belly with a little bit of fish pepper hot sauce and a red eye gravy. Um, and again, that was just a dish that we grew up with. That was like what we ate when... Uh, we needed to eat something when we were in the country. You know, they always had some ground corn, um, and there was always some greens. If we were lucky, you might get an egg with it. Um, so they were super lucky today in that they got uh, pork belly. Um, and then we had ash roasted uh, sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes that were grown at our farm in South Baltimore uh, that we roasted um, in ash. Um, and that dish kind of really represented a lot of things. Um, the most interesting thing was a passage from one of my favorite novels, Beloved by Toni Morrison, where she recounts this very um, humorous experience uh, amongst the men who were, you know, who spent a considerable amount of time trying to roast sweet potatoes so that the sweet potatoes would be ready for them to eat during their break for the next day. And in the, in, the, in the book, she details how they never quite get it right. 
Some days the, the potatoes are overcooked. Some days they're undercooked. Some days the, the fire gets snuffed out and the potatoes are raw. But, you know, this sweet potato, to me, you know, is one of those quintessential dishes or one of those quintessential foods of the African-American experience um, and in a lot of ways represents the beauty, um, the, the savor of, of what came out of that enslavement experience <clears throat> um, and just that relationship with the earth. And, um, you know, we, we see sweet potatoes during this time of year at the table as candied yams, um, but we really wanted to highlight sweet potatoes and, and lift up the, the fact that this was an incredibly important food source. It's sweet, it's delicious. Um, and then made a, we made a little ginger, little ginger drink, little ginger jubilee drink, with, which, is, uh, um, which is a drink of celebration. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we couldn't put a little rum in it. It's okay. Um, yeah. It was so perfect. So we really thank you for sharing your love of food and your family and an amazing meal with us. Thank you to also to your colleague that made it possible. I know you were trying to do a lot of things at the same time <laughs> yeah. and dining services for us. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you. And uh, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking themselves. <laughs>